Well, I caused the Great Depression. I was born June 14th, 1929, and it happened, you know, in October of the same year. My family couldn't afford me. <laughs> well, we were in Columbus, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was born in Tryon and brought up in Columbus. Mm -hmm. Up until that time, they were fairly, they were very comfortable, let's say. But after that, with stocks, the market collapsing and so forth, income from those things was gone. And um, my father um, became a, a mechanic, really. I mean, he tried to get jobs here and there. He was an engineer. He'd worked for his father, my grandfather, who was a a large um, road building and dam building contractor. But those businesses, of course, were defunct. And um, so they had to find ways to survive. And the small town uh, changed its rules to allow people to, in order to feed themselves, to have a cow and a pig and chickens within the town limits, which before had been um, forbidden. So my mother, uh, besides those things, the cow provided the milk and the butter, etc. And whatever was extra she could sell, or you might say barter, at the stores for things that uh, she couldn't raise or didn't have at home, uh, like sugar or lard or whatever they called it in those days um, and she always had a vegetable garden and a few fruit trees and the vegetables we ate in the season but we also she did she canned them that's the days before freezers and they put things up in glass jars and in the fall autumn um, when it started getting cold, they slaughtered the pig and kept the, uh, or put up the meat, uh, cured it. As I, re I don't recall really whether it was smoked or, or salted down, maybe salted. Um, so we had the meat, uh, some of it, you might say, through the winter uh, months, and the vegetables, uh, fruits that were canned when it was off-season. Um, and basically that's the way we survived. Some income, some little income would trickle in from maybe a stock recovering or something like that. Or maybe the job my father had until he died in 1936 in an accident, an automobile accident. So leaving my mother with six children. And she took hold and reared us, fed us, clothed us. Now, often the clothing was made by herself. Young ladies in her day learned to sew and to make their clothes, even it didn't matter if they had the means to go out and buy them. It was a proper thing for them to do, to learn to sew and knit and crochet or whatever they, all those things are, the needlepoint, etc. And she did that. She made our clothes, and sometimes out of my father's suits, etc., she cut down and maybe made a couple of suits for two of us or two of the boys or something. Um, so we were clothed well, dressed well, and fed well, housed well, and we survived. And then the uh, cologne came. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt and his um, um, program of welfare. I think that's what you called it in those days. At any rate, my mother refused to take it. It was beyond her pride, her dignity, she felt, to uh, do that. Her father had also was a very successful man with his many farms and cotton business and his uh, uh, other businesses. And he was also very prominent in 
the political and social situ situation in that area, not only Columbus, but Tryon, Rutherford, Tillon, and so forth. And he, it was beyond her, her pride and her dignity to take any government assistance. And she did it. She was an amazing woman, an amazing woman. And she imparted that same pride and dignity and the necessity of making our own way and of preparing ourselves to make our own way. And again, as I say, she did it very, very well. And until then, through my schooling, my grammar school, etc., um, we lived like that. We lived very well. Uh, had a small town school until I was 16 and went away after the war, after World War II uh, in 1946. I went away to school in Oak Park, Illinois, a Chicago suburb, a very fine high school for which I'm very grateful. And by that time, World War II had really brought the country out of the Depression. No government programs brought it out of the Depression. It was the World War that brought us out of it. The industry that happened. Uh, so uh, we were out of that and things were recovering. Um, as I say, bonds and stocks and some of them recovered, um, as well as there were jobs for people. Um, basically, that's the story of my experience in the Depression. Exactly, it was. It taught you independence, it taught you to, to make your own way under whatever circumstances. Instead of blaming the system or condemning the system or other people or thinking that other people or the government, the collective, owed you something. She taught us that we owed it. And she had come from, as I said before, a very comfortable position. In my uh, college years, af long after the Depression, I was visiting uh, through, an aunt had taken me to, with her to see their family lawyer, who was a very prominent uh, citizen and attorney of Rutherford in North Carolina. And he said, when he found my name or heard my name, he's he began to question me about my grandfathers. And my first grand name, of course, uh, my own name gave him that clue of Constance. But then he asked me my mother's father's name. And he said, oh my. And my aunt, by marriage, said, oh, you knew them. He said, I certainly did. They probably were the two wealthiest men these two counties ever produced. So those are the circumstances under which my mother grew up. They had help, they had servants, they had field hands on the farms, etc. Um, so she was accustomed to comforts, um, but she did never complain. I never heard her one time say, why me? How did this happen? Why am I having to do this? She had a sense of humor and she imparted that to us. A sense of joy was based on her great Christian faith. And that's what brought her through, and that's how she brought us through. Do you know, I have to answer that by quoting President Dwight Eisenhower. Maybe you've already heard it. A, a reporter asked him in an interview, Mr. President, were you poor when you were growing up? He sat back and he said, well, I guess we were, but we didn't know it. Because everyone was in the same situation. You, um, your friends, they were 
you know, I suppose they were doing the same thing. I suppose their mothers were doing much the same thing in clothing them. Now, our food naturally wasn't quail under glass or uh, lovely steaks or whatever. In fact, during the war, those were rationed. You had ration stamps. So that added to the lack of anything you didn't grow yourself. Um, very seldom would your uh, butcher shop or your grocery store get in certain things that, like sugar or a certain meats, etc. Um, and when you did, you had a certain number of uh, food stamps. They were ration stamps. They weren't, those again were not uh, welfare. They were, everyone had them. You could only buy so much gasoline where they had stamps for that. Um, so when that, the, and the, at those times, you could, uh, if the market had enough of it in your town, if you got there early enough, <laughs> you might uh, find some of those. But you, you were felt well fed from the garden. Um, we ate a lot of beans and rice, uh, which I still like very much today. Um, so you had plenty of protein, you might say, etc. And, and you survived. You didn't really think that you were deprived. You never did. You ate and you were always happy when mealtime came, because there was always plenty. Um, no, we didn't know we were poor. And I wasn't aware of other people being poor, because we were all sort of similar. Indeed, it certainly has. Um, in the first place, I, I don't agree when people say it's the worst uh, uh, economic situation we've had since the Great Depression. There wasn't one before in the 80s. Um, and I, we were here then, of course. And there was, um, people came through that, um, survived it, and profited later on things. Um, it has given me a long view. It has told me that individuals can do it if they're encouraged to do it, not by handouts, because you create a, a class of dependence. And we've done that since the 30s. We really have. And you can't blame people when they are expecting uh, the big house, White House, the Congress, whomever, to hand it to them. Today we call them street people or homeless. Um, in those days we called them hobos, because those, they did travel around, around by, um, you know, grabbing a freight car and so forth and so on. Um, and very frequently, one would appear at your door, your back door, kitchen door, and again, my mother always had something to hand them, to give them, and always did. Um, so, yes, we did see that. I think probably toward the end of the war, um, that was about 1945, um, when peace was declared and so forth, when the, the Japanese were the, fin the last ones to surrender. And I believe about along then, uh, to the best of my recollection, and then of course when I arrived in um, Illinois, in Chicago, um, things were, it was a larger city, so you were more aware of new cars and things like that, I think. From Chicago, I went, I moved to Santa Barbara, California, to go to the University of California at Santa Barbara. And after my, uh, getting my BA degree there, I was in the Army during the Korean War for two years. 
and came out of the Army and went back to UCSB for my master's degree in political science. In political science, unless I always thought I was going to be the greatest statesman in the world, then I decided after being in the Army that government work, no matter where, was too much like the Army. So I decided I'd better go into business. So I went into uh, venture capital, uh, my, my own investments, and also when people would hear that I was involved in something, they wanted to know about it, so they would get involved. And the first, you know, commissions, etc., were coming, and it became very profitable. The reason, the way I got to Georgetown County, um, friends from Greenville, of course, Tryon, Columbus, are you know very close to, comparatively close, close to Greenville, and the friends there were, had a company called the Litchfield Company of South Carolina. And at a point they asked me to, if I would invest, buy the shares of one of the original partners that had passed away, and his wife wanted to cash out. And I didn't think, you know, living in California, that that was for me at first, but then I decided, okay, I'll do it. And we were coming down for board meetings two or three times a year, a couple of times a year at least. And my wife is a Californian by birth, Los Angeles area, Beverly Hills. And she fell in love with the area and the people and so forth. Um, and at one point she wanted to see a plantation. The word plantation attracts an awful lot of people. It has a romance about it, I think. So our friends in the Litchfield Company said, we'll show you some plantations. And um, they did. They knew everybody here. And she wanted to come back. After we saw Shakura Wood from the outside, the next time we were down, she wanted to come back. And the owner uh, met us here and brought us inside. It needed a lot of love. It had been quite a while. They had lived in town and used it only on weekends and for shooting and so forth, etc. And outside, here in front, my wife said to me, uh, sort of privately, I'm sure she thought, wouldn't it be fun to buy an old place like this and have our California friends visit us at our southern plantation? Well, one of the partners overheard that. And about, oh, we got back to Santa Barbara several days later, telephone rang early in the morning. and. I said, Foster, it's five o'clock in the morning. He said, I don't care. I think you and Marsha could buy Shakura wood. And I said, what's that? I, I couldn't remember the names of these places. And he said, you know, the plantation y'all liked. I said, We're not in the market for a plantation, not even a second home. We had a, a condo at the beach, so here. At any rate, here we are 26 years later, owning, or should I say it owns us, Shakura Wood Plantation. So that's the way we came to be here. And we split our time almost equally. Another week or two, you might say, extra in Santa Barbara, which is our legal residence, our voting residence. And, uh, but we, we love both places.